Sometimes you have an object that can obviously be represented by a graph. So simple examples like you say, ah, oh, I've got a network of computers and you know the computers maybe are, are connected or not pairwise and you say, okay, the vertices are the computers and the edges are whether or not there's a connection. And those are kind of straightforward things, but graphs show up in all kinds of other settings where you might not have immediately thought of them as graphs. So here's one that you may not have ever thought of. Like imagine you are a wedding planner and you are trying to make a seating chart for the wedding. All right, so um, this is a hard task. You probably hear stories about people fighting over the seating chart and such and such. And part of the reasons it's a hard task is that you've got all these people and let's face it, some people just can't sit near each other, right? There are people who hate each other. And so if you drew a graph <coughs> where uh, the edges in the graph actually represent a conflict, that is, they can't sit next to each other, then, uh, well, that gives you a graph. And I just drew a, like just some random graph here, but imagine that this is the graph, and here are the tables, and uh, obviously, I guess we have more chairs here than people, but if this is a subgraph of the graph, you know that there's information here about, you know, who can sit next to whom and who can't, because it might be, you know, like this could be some kind of uh, sibling rivalry. Let me get a nice dark marker for this one. I should have a big red one. So this could be a sibling rivalry, you know, or, you know, there could be, there could be a long lasting feud over here. And, oh, you know, actually these two right here, these are X's. And in fact, most of the edges in this graph are people who are, uh, used to date. So that's, there might be some, some other ones here. Uh, you know, we just can't, can't sit next to each other. So now uh, your task as the wedding planner is to assign the vertices of the graph to the tables, right? And so we number the tables, or here's table zero, table one, table two, all the best wedding planners always start with table zero, um, but actually probably none of them do, but computer scientists do. So uh, our goal is to map these vertices to the tables so that if there's an edge, then, um, then, those two vertices have to be at different tables. All right, pretty straightforward um, kind of problem. And one way to think of it is what we call graph coloring, okay? So here are some graphs. Uh, let's start with this one up here. This graph, it's a nice bipartite graph. If I were to assign colors to the vertices, so now the tables have been replaced with colors, and the goal of graph coloring is to assign colors to the vertices. I'll make these blue. And I've only got two colors, so I might be in a little bit of trouble later. Uh, I'll color these yellow. I want it to be the case that if there's an edge between two vertices, then they have different colors. And in the case of bipartite graphs, we kind of know that this is going to be perfect, that we're going to have no edges between any of the vertices on this side and no edges between any of the vertices on this side. Uh, that is, in fact, the definition of a bipartite graph. And so we know we can color one part, one color, and the other part, another color. You can also notice something here, which is that uh, it kind of looks like we're mapping the parts. If I number these 0 and 1 here, if these were the tables or the color classes, it kind of looks like a mapping from one graph to this graph. And let me put my colors in here. I'm going to lose the zero, but you'll know what I mean here. This is the zero and the one. And this mapping, well, we kind of talked quite a bit about what uh, mappings between graphs ought to be. We should think of them as homomorphisms. And this one really is a homomorphism, mapping all of these vertices to this vertex here, and all of these vertices, let me just put a dotted line around here, to this vertex over here. Um, it's not the only homomorphism from this graph to this one. In this graph, you may remember, oh, this will be important, this is a complete graph on two vertices. But it, it is in fact a homomorphism, so that it seems like there's gonna be some relationship between colorings and homomorphisms. And it turns out it's gonna be a very strong relationship. We'll work it out in detail. But first, let's do a couple more examples. So here's one, another graph, and um, let's see. If I were to try to color this one, let's start around the outside. Um, okay, so say I start with a gray one, and then a blue one. Um, uh, if I'm trying to get by with only two colors, let's see how far I can get. I can go gray, blue, gray. This is one possibility. And now I actually definitely need a third color for 
this graph because this vertex is adjacent to both blue and gray, so I'll make it yellow. Now this is A coloring. You might immediately jump to the idea that there's a problem in here, a computational problem, which would be to try to find the coloring that uses the fewest colors. And that's an important computational problem. It's called graph coloring. Um, and just sometimes you even get a decision problem, a yes or no question like, can this graph be colored with only two colors or with only three colors? It turns out that, that um, checking if a graph can be colored with only two colors is not so hard. Checking if a graph can be colored with only three colors is actually kind of hard. We'll talk a lot about that maybe hopefully by the end of the, this class. So this one we could get away with three colors. Uh, how about in this one, uh, actually let's make this, this is the same graph again. I could do another coloring on here, but what if I add another edge? So um, this is supposed to be connected there. So if I have this extra edge, now um, I think that I actually will need four colors. I'm not sure I could get away with just, uh, with just these three colors. I think four colors are necessary. And uh, I think right at this point, if you want, uh, you might want to stop and think about whether or not you could prove that you actually need four colors here. And it's a, kind of a good little exercise to see that, um, that you can't get away with just three, three colors. All right. So I said that this was true. Let's prove it. Uh, or at least work out what, what, what it means. So I said that coloring can be thought of as a homomorphism. Okay, so here it is. Coloring as homomorphism. The idea is pretty simple. You know, we know from the definition that we have some set of colors. Let's just say there's p colors, 0 to p minus 1. And uh, the coloring is going to be assigning colors to the vertices. Okay, so if you think of that as a function, Right, this is a function uh, from the vertices to this set. And it's worth noting that this set over here, this is the vertex set of the complete graph on P vertices. It's also the vertex set of some of the other canonical graphs, but this is the, the important one for us. So you can think of this as a mapping between vertex sets. And then the rule that we have to satisfy is that if two vertices are adjacent, so U, V, U, W here are, are uh, in an edge. So if they're adjacent, that implies they should have different colors. Okay, so this, this uh, claim right here that CV of U is not equal to CV of W means that, yeah, adjacency should imply different colors. In other words, if we were to extend this function on the vertices to a function on the edges, we're saying that C E, C for coloring here, E is the, now the function on edges, so of this edge UW, right, by definition would be CV of U, CV of W, and since they're different colors, this is a, this is a pair of distinct, it's actually two different uh, vertices here, so it could possibly be an edge, and in fact is an edge in the complete graph. So what we've actually done here is we've written the mapping that is this homomorphism uh, from G into the complete graph. We've taken the coloring and we've shown that this coloring actually gives us a homomorphism from the graph to the complete graph. And this is, um, this is both necessary and sufficient to be a coloring. So here's, a, here's that claim more formally. So there exists a coloring, or there exists a, let's, a homomorphism, let's call it C, from a graph to the complete graph on P vertices, if and only if that graph can be colored with P colors. So if it can be colored with P colors, we'll also say that it can be P colored, um, you know, where P could be any number here. If it's three, we would say it can be three colored. And in this case, you see we have, uh, this is the graph we saw before. This is a three coloring of that graph. And that three coloring can be also thought of now as this homomorphism from G into K3. Um, and we can just check this because if C exists, then uh, CV tells us how to color the vertices because CV is going to be a function from uh, the vertex set of G into the numbers 0 to P minus 1. 
So it actually gives the coloring, and then we just have to check that it really works. So, um, so if u, v are adjacent with the same color, then, uh, well, that would mean that c, e of u, v had only one vertex in it, because u and v were the same color. That means they got mapped to the same vertex, so the size of this set Right, this pair is actually only one, um, so it's not an edge, which would mean that, yeah, so C E of U V is not an edge of any graph, never mind K3. And so that would be a contradiction. So if it, if they were if if this mapping doesn't actually correspond to a coloring, then you get a contradiction. Okay, I'm gonna write this uh, symbol for a contradiction. It's the logical bottom. All right, let's see if I can squeeze some space in here. So on the other hand, if G can be p-colored, then um, the coloring is a function from the vertices to the colors, and that function can just be uh, extended to a homomorphism, and we just have to check that it really is a homomorphism. All right, so what we'll do is we'll number the colors. We'll make sure that that mapping of the colors uh, the vertices to colors really is a mapping into numbers. So we number the colors 0 to p minus 1, and now define cv of u to be the color of u in the coloring. And then you just have to check. Again, this is essentially what we checked uh, just, just now, is that c the color, this homomorphism, which is defined by CV and CE, and remember with a homomorphism, once you define CV, CE is fixed, that this really is a homomorphism. I'll leave that part as an exercise, um, but it's quite simple to do. Okay, so what this means is we have this intuitive picture where we've drawn our graph with nice circles, and we got out our colors, and we colored the, the vertices different colors, and we required that the adjacent vertices had different colors. And that's a nice intuitive process. You could teach that to an elementary school child to kind of as a game to play with. On the other hand now, we can understand it also purely in terms of homomorphisms, right? So there's a P coloring if and only if there exists a homomorphism from the graph into the complete graph. Now, this might seem like utterly unnecessary complexity to add, but in fact, it's really useful because there are a lot of uh, cases where when you think about the relationship between two graphs in terms of a homomorphism, you might want to take some object or some structure, some fact about one graph, and extend it to another graph. And if the property of being uh, p-colorable is expressed in terms of homomorphisms, then we can actually compose the colorings with other homomorphisms. I'll show you what I mean by that. So if we say that chi of g is the minimum p such that g can be p-colored, right? This is also called the chromatic number of the graph, right? Then, then we're going to use this fact, this relationship between colorings and homomorphisms to prove that this is a graph invariant. I think you would be able to prove this without uh, this perspective, but it becomes utterly simple once you have it. So let's do it. We're going to show that this is a graph invariant, and here's how. You see, we assume that we have some isomorphism between a graph G and a graph H. Okay, so if G and H are isomorphic. We want to prove that, that this invariant is the same, or this function, let's, right now we're proving it's invariant. We want to show that the chromatic number is the same for G and H. Okay, so if um, H can be colored with P colors, then uh, here it is. In fact, I've even said that this homomorphism is the coloring, right? So let this be the coloring of H. Then we're just going to compose these two homomorphisms. So uh, what would that be? This is going to be C composed with F. And let's be clear about what this is. This is uh, G, right, to H, to H, to KP. So this is G 
to Kp. So just by composing right, the isomorphism with the coloring, we get a coloring, a p coloring in fact, of G. Okay, so if I, that means if I can color H with the P colors, then I can color G. Um, but it also means vice versa, because if I have, um, if I had a coloring of G, then I also have an isomorphism going in the other direction, right? That's part of the definition of an isomorphism, is I have the maps going in both ways. So it means that uh, just symmetrically, Any coloring of, of one can be turned into a coloring of the other. So for all P, G can be P colored if and only if H can be P colored. So in particular, it holds for the minimum. So, um, right, so this pretty much directly implies that the chromatic number of G is going to be equal to the chromatic number of H. Now, if you were to try to work through this without trying to write it in terms of homomorphisms, probably what you would have to do is you'd have to say, I'm going to start with a coloring of one graph, and then I would, you would still take the isomorphism, and you'd say how the colors of one get pushed through the isomorphism to, the, to be colorings of the other, and then you'd have to check that you didn't accidentally color two adjacent vertices the same color. Right, so the, all those extra checks are actually already folded into the definition of a homomorphism. Right, so you get this kind of immediate way of taking one coloring, pushing it through the isomorphism, and getting our coloring of the other graph. Right, so it's very, very um, kind of direct way to prove these these facts. All right.